And greetings, welcome to The Dividing Line on a Thursday afternoon. Yes, things have changed. I, um... Uh, I haven't had anything to do with it, so you can't blame me. I, I just, I was just informed that this is what we're gonna do. It's like, okay, whatever, you know. I, it's, uh, it's somebody else's fault if you're upset. Um, I know there are certain people probably in the fetal position right now because, uh, well, no, I don't there's know what, definitely more than one. Well, in <laughs> fact, I don't know what what's Nick gonna do. People rocking back. Nick and forth. used to listen to the way back constantly. I yes. mean, while riding around in Ukraine, you yes. have left him in silence. Yes. Well, we have uh, we've moved things over to uh, to sermon audio, and uh, for the longest time, I have uh, had folks tell me that we are uh, expected to provide our MP3s, uh, all our audio recordings, for free, and we weren't really. Uh, in a position to be able to do that until recently. And uh, I felt the time was right, and so I made the move. And a, a camera looks like it's on. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, he's a funny guy. Let's see here. All right. Let's well, my, my lips ain't moving, dude. Okay, well, there we are. Hey, yeah. There you how go. How you doing, everybody? Now you're nervous, huh? Yeah, yeah, well, now I'm hey, on the you're, spot. Hey, you're the one that stuck the cameras in here, not me. Yeah, well, it's actually worked out pretty well, I that's, think. That's true. So anyway. Uh, so, but the bottom line is, is that uh, we need to make a change. And the fact of the matter is, even though I moved the cheese, the cheese is still there. Uh, you just uh, got to be willing to step out of your comfort zone just a little bit. And uh, and you can, uh, you can find what you had before. You might find more than you bargained for, but you'll find it. And so uh, I've prepared a uh, little, uh, just kind of a run through, real quick, of um, of the sermon audio page, and it's basically sermonaudio.com/slash/aominorg, a-o-m-i-n-org. Um, you go there, and uh, I have uploaded every single dividing line that we have. Some of those early ones didn't get recorded. And, you know, unfortunately, now I really, really, really wish they had been. But um, we, uh, I've got to go through this stuff right here that I'm pointing at and, and get that, you know, straightened out to where they look more like this. Uh, but eventually we'll have a situation to where uh, things look more like this by series. So as we go into the 1998, which I'm actually really uh, quite pleased with, um, you can see now that they actually have titles about what was discussed. You know, I got to tell you, James, I, I've been re-listening to these so that I could get a, you know, be able to do a description. And they're not half bad. <laughs> <laughs> they really weren't half bad. So, um, but uh, I'm into uh, 1999 uh, here and... Um, when I started the upload of all this, you can see I'm, I'm stuck here at February 20th, uh, and I'll be moving on. And a lot of these, I get past 1999, I'm pretty sure we already have the descriptions. I just need to copy them over. And that is one of the unfortunate things of how Sermon Audio has things. I unfortunately can't give them a file with all of what we had and say, here, you know, suck this into your system and, and make it fly. But we'll make it work. We will. So, um, but um, did have a, uh, a circumstance, uh, a very nice lady this morning brought to my attention uh, where apparently she had in her, you know, how we have these quick links on the top of our, our, our browsers. And she had Dr. James White's name in the search and she'd saved the link that way. And she's got a number of different people that she likes to listen to. Well, the problem was is that She's used to seeing like last Sunday's message and the last message you gave, et cetera, come to the top of the screen here. And then I went and dumped 1,200 files that are all flagged as new <laughs> into the, uh, the search here. And I still am on the learning curve for sermon audio and the way they do things myself. So I kind of had to poke around in here to, to discover it. And I realized what we need to do here is if you want to look at what you've done at Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church, uh, you you go there. So it would be, you know, PR, uh, actually, uh, you can see up here, Phoenix Ref BAP. 
or just simply you know put that Pink's Reform Baptist in the search engine at Sermon Audio, and this is going to pop up for you. Um, she uh, was desirous of narrowing the search even more so that only your stuff uh, comes up. And as you come down here, you can click on that, and there's <clears throat> Jim Broyles of Sunday School, Jim Callahan, Rob Crosby's in there, Don Fry, John Gerizzo, uh, Mike Porter, and there at the bottom is James White. And this is what happens when you do that. Now all of your stuff in order now comes in for Phoenix Reformed Baptist Church. So it's simply a matter of, of finding the, the sort keys in uh, the Sermon Audio Dialogue and uh, putting that together. We also can do that here uh, down below. Um, you can do sermons by speaker. Ah, look at that. There is John Sanson's dividing lines. Uh, he's done. He's done a few uh, along the way. And um, sermons by series. This is like I said. This is gonna be my favorite part. When I first uploaded the first batches, oh, this is good. I should I should switch over to that shot where you're over there goofing around, trying to distract me. Thank you. Um, I. Didn't realize I'm dumping everything into the dividing line series. Squirrel. 1,200 files into the dividing line series. And that was kind of a mistake, and then I realized I needed to, to back off that. So I will fix these, I believe, 2015 through 2012 uh, files. And uh, just so that people can see what you're doing, James is over there playing with a triple while I'm doing this. Very, very, very funny. And... Um, but back to serious things. Again, if you want to drill down, you can go here. This is eventually going to get divided up where you have the uh, historical order proper, and uh, and you can uh, take care of things from there. So, um, and uh, that's that's about all I have. All right. Well, good. Um, so, I mean, if people wanted to do a Wayback Machine type thing, they could just... Oh, that's. Uh, I'm really glad you mentioned that because, again... Well, I just feel sorry for Nick, that's all. Well, uh, back over here, um, I was going to demo this. Let me uh, pop this over here and get back over to this original page here. Um, if, you, if you're at the Alpha and Omega page, you click on the podcast right here. And that is going to give you three different options. One of them we don't use because Sermon Audio actually has a blog feature in it. And we're probably not going to use the blog feature. We already have our own WordPress blog. Um, but there's the Apple iTunes link. And then there's the generic XML podcast feed that you can put into other uh, uh, systems. Uh, but, you know, everybody knows Apple iTunes is the only one really out there anyway. So that's the one you want to use. Brace yourself, though, folks. Because if you click on that and drop that into your iTunes uh, or your phone, uh, one gentleman reported to me yesterday that he yeah, but was. You define that. You define that in iTunes. You define how many to download in iTunes. Okay. Well, he he got he got when he wasn't tethered to a network forty shows. Yeah. Well, it's and gonna uh, be, a, so, be a rough rough month for for. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say his yeah. his his online minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I uh, hope he's got unlimited. But most folks don't have that anymore. So, you so, know, there's, there's someone channel going. So the iTunes channel is done, gone. The old one is gone. The old, the old podcast one is, link. Yeah, and part of part of this came set up a new one. A, a number of different things came together to go to critical mass on this. Not the least of which, people started complaining. Hey, the uh, the icon for the the Apple Podcast is gone. It just disappeared, and there wasn't anything we could do about it. And I went and started digging into it and found out our podcast software is so incredibly old that I didn't change anything. It's still in there, but for some reason, iTunes has moved on beyond it and is losing track of things that it was trying to feed to it. So this is really just a, a win win all the way around, as far as I'm concerned. So. Yep, and well, folks let's, let's. Uh, are finally going to get full access to all of those, and there's going to be more coming. There you go. There's going to be more coming where we'll eventually have all of our MP3s, all of our MP3s up here. All right, there you go. So there's, you know, everybody was asking me about, and I'm, I'm going, I, I, I don't know, I, I just work here. Um, <laughs> I have 
have no control over these things. So Sermon Audio is where everything is, and uh, as long as Sermon Audio is still putzing along, then we'll be putzing along. Um, we'll see how long all of that lasts. Anyway, um, so there you go. There's uh, there's that. Now, two things before we get to a subject and we open the phones and do stuff like that. Um, please don't forget the debate in Anaheim this uh, weekend uh, between myself and Sheikh Mustafa Umar on Jesus, Prophet, and or God. Of course, from my perspective, it's Jesus, Prophet, Priest, King, Messiah, Son of God, uh, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, etc., etc. Um, but that'll be at 4.30. The information's on the website. Please uh, pray for that as well. Uh, looking forward to uh, meeting Sheikh Umar and uh, um, hopefully lots of uh, Muslims and Christians will be there. Um, even though it's, well, it's a Saturday, so 4.30 is not that big of a deal as to what time it is. And um, secondly, I, I need to start reminding folks, um, October is coming. Well, why would that be relevant? Well, uh, don't have everything worked out yet, obviously, uh, especially at this time of year, but uh, heading for South Africa, I know uh, that we talked last year and are continuing to talk about doing a series of lectures at, um, okay, it's Northwest University, but everyone still refers to it as Poch, Pochstrom, uh, Pochstrom University. Uh, obviously a school that I have connections with, uh, with the staff and, and uh, have been speaking there each time I've gone down and, and uh, want to do more of that in the future. But uh, doing a series in response to Bart Ehrman's um, book, How Jesus Became God, and uh, we'll be doing that. I, I'm i almost hesitant to, to talk to Vody Balcom. We had talked uh, months ago. He wants me to come to Zambia when I'm in South Africa because it's not that far to go. Um, but it's going to be so close to when he's moved. It's going to be difficult. But I'm, I'm, we're going to see if, that, if that's going to work out. Um, he'll, he won't even be settled yet, but we'll see. And of course, uh, looks like uh, uh, possibilities in Durban uh, as well. Lots of opportunities to pursue in uh, in South Africa, and especially that trip. We need uh, all the assistance we can get from our our audience to uh, make that happen. And uh, especially if we're looking at even a longer period than I've gone before. Uh, to make room for all the opportunities and to make room for the possibility of going up to Zambia and things like that. Um, you know, this ministry is small. Uh, people don't understand. They figure if you've been around for 32 years, then you must have some, some deep pockets that are given to you. That's not the case. Um, we are very much supported by, by individuals. And uh, so the... Uh, Travel link is active. I will try to remember to link to it. It's uh, store.aomin.org slash travel.html. And uh, there you see it on the screen. And uh, so we, we need to start uh, raising the funds to be able to, uh, to take advantage of things. If you like being able to, uh, and I, I know a lot of people who do this, to be able to link Muslims uh, two debates where the debate's taking place inside a mosque. It's, 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 it's so obviously a fair context, or in fact, a advantage Muslim context. Uh, then, and as we've mentioned before, we're wanting to do much more focused debates on specific topics like uh, Isaiah 53, is Isaiah 53 a prophecy of Jesus? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, so we uh, very rarely talk about funding and things like that. Uh, it's not that it's not that we wouldn't have the right to do so. It's just because of the topics that we address. It's just part of the reality of, I think, doing apologetics in a uh, appropriate fashion uh, that it has to be 
handled in the proper way. Uh, this ministry, as I said, is not funded by people with big pockets. Uh, in our experience, pretty much everyone who's ever come around the pa in the past that had big pockets and made big promises didn't happen. Um, and I've said many times, I'm not smart enough um, to do the kind of fundraising stuff that a lot of people do do. Um, there, there are ministries that have 10, 15, 20, 30 people working for them. And, you know, they've got entire groups that do nothing but call people and, uh, you know, continue relationships with big donors. Thing. There's two of us. That's it, you know. And uh, so uh, that's, that's our situation. Uh, so the travel's coming up. I'm excited about it. And the sooner it's all underwritten, the more excited I'll be because then I can focus upon the actual preparation rather than uh, than other things. So uh, keep that in, keep that in mind. Keep that in prayer if you can help us. If your church could help us, that'd be even greater. I'd love to see some churches uh, step up and say, you know, we'd like to really help to make uh, this trip to South Africa a possibility and things like that. Um, and uh, that that would be very encouraging. All right, I don't. Obviously, I went some. I, I think the Dallas trip uh, knocked the needle off my record or something, which doesn't mean a thing to anyone who's under forty, I guess. Um, but uh, <laughs> knock the what? Eh? Needle what? Um, but uh, a couple weeks ago, <laughs> I've been on Unbelievable many times. And most of the time I'm in studio, but I've done I've done unbelievable from right here a number of times, including the I was sitting right here for the um, uh, debate with N.T. Wright and the one with uh, Brian McLaren, uh, and uh, but most of my most of the time I've been in the studio, and so I can see Justin's face. Okay. <laughs> And I started listening to the encounter between uh, Jane Ozani and Robert Gagnon on same-sex marriage, homosexuality. Does scripture forbid same-sex relationships? There is a specific title. Uh, there, there's just nobody out there that can take on Gagnon. Um, not, not on any scholarly level. That, it isn't. That's why they generally run and hide. And and uh, you know, as I was mentioning, I I mentioned the PCUSA minister Octemeyer and his book that I read over the weekend while riding. And uh, you know, doesn't even mention, doesn't even try. Uh, it's just like eh, not there, not there. So I had, I was looking forward to listening to this, and as I was listening to it, and as it heated up and it it heated up primarily well for a number of reasons the lesbian representative um is enough to cause any righteous man to pull his hair out in frustration and anger I i'm sorry but when you are promoting ungodliness and you do it with such a syrupy, sickly, sweet, empty, constantly empty rhetoric of, oh, but we just think about the love of God, the love of God. You could put anything in there. You could put pedophilia, bestiality, thievery, uh, every form of fornication, murder. It doesn't matter. We just think about the love of God, the love. We just think about the love of God. And you, you can never define, you know, what's the source of your knowledge of what the love of God is, what its characteristics are, what it's going to do. Well, that would be scripture, but no, 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 no. We just, oh, oh no. and so he, he actually got to the part, the point where it got a little bit on the heat inside, you know, and I can, I was sitting there listening to it and I'm, I'm, I'm just picturing I'm, I'm, because they obviously are in the same studio, so I know which studio it was. And I'm just picturing Justin's face as he is 
Just one voice in the maelstrom of sound. <laughs> Sorry, Justin. <laughs> but I can see you. And I can I can just see you. But 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 well now but <laughs> it was uh <clears throat> If, if it was such, the, the, the subject is so serious, but eventually, I, I, I mean, we are we are just being so overwhelmed with foolishness on the subject that once in a while you, you've got to try to laugh because this was um, this was amazing, um, p painfully obvious. The the difference between these two sides, painfully obvious, that one takes the Bible seriously. And the other simply does not. The, the, just these, these empty, empty, pietistic phrases to get around actually providing meaningful exegesis. I mean, that's, that's what you have from Jane with constant little shots. And you're going to hear that here. You know, just zing, zing. And eventually Bob's like, oh, come on. So anyway, I, I want to play a section of this. And uh, to just to give you the feeling, if you, I suggested everybody listen to it. I'm sure I did on the program at some point. But if you didn't, I'm going to play a section of it and um, comment on it. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure how different it would have been uh, had, I, had I been there. Because when, when she starts talking about uh, your, your certainty... She's presenting a certainty. She just she just won't defend it. I mean, the 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 utter incoherence of the thinking and worldview of this individual is um, stunning, stunning. It really is. Um, and I guess we I get you know over there in Europe, uh, all opinions must be considered equal, no matter how stunningly inane they are. And uh, that's uh, that's obviously a problem with uh, culture over there. Anyway, let's um, let's take a listen here, and I am not speeding it up because <laughs> that would not work to speed this up at all. Here's um, here's where things started getting uh, interesting. Frankly, I'm not accurately representing the Greco-Roman evidence and cultural context here. The indictment of lesbianism, too, which is clearly what Romans 126 is doing. I can give several arguments for that if there's any debate point about that. Lesbianism in antiquity is not noted for those kinds of characteristics that is being conducted in an exploitative context with, a, with an adolescent or with a slave or with a prostitute. So when lesbianism is being indicted, it includes committed relationships. So that's why Bruton, a self-identified lesbian, writing 150 pages on Romans 126, says you cannot use the argument that this is only indicting exploitative relationships. The indictment of lesbianism, lesbianism makes that clear. Paul even talks in the context about mutuality, mutually desiring one another. He's not talking about it having done to one. The word for desire there is not limited to the kind of lust context in which you're talking about. The word epithemeo is used for desire for any form of sexual intercourse expressly forbidden by God. And the language of being inflamed is likewise used. It doesn't mean that they're just overlusted or they're, uh, Paul's talking about only constitutional heterosexuals. By the way, j just, just in passing, I think, I think that when I first heard this, I'm sitting here going, okay, he's making specific reference there, uh, the over-lusted phrase. Uh, that's one of the key arguments uh, in Brownson. And I think that's where, where Dr. Gagnon was at least making some type of a reference in that direction without really having time to expand upon it. The argument is used as a structural argument for any desire for any sexual behavior that God has prohibited by definition is an inflaming, whether or not we perceive it as being... Well, I, I mean, Jane talked about, okay, what about the scenario where it's people, it talks about exchanging their natural desires for, for unnatural. Right. Could that be in the context of a heterosexual person, as it were, in an unnatural way, trying out homosexuality when no. it isn't actually there? God-given desire. No, and right. this is why even when Bernadette Bruton addresses that argument, the New Testament lesbian scholar I mentioned, or again, William Loder, they say, no, 
It doesn't work that way. That's not what's being exchanged here in the context. What's being exchanged here in the context very clearly, because this is the parallel between the discussion about idolatry and sexual immorality with same-sex intercourse singled out. The context for the argument is not just that all sin, but that all deliberately suppress the truth about God accessible to them. Now, it's important you catch this. I was uh, I started teaching um, teaching this semester. First semester I've been teaching for Phoenix Seminary. And we're teaching a class on apologetics and a good size group. And uh, last evening, we, you know, I, I always start off, well, not always, but generally start off with uh, a comparison of the opening presentation from William Lane Craig and uh, Greg Bonson on debates regarding the existence of God. And, and then move into Romans 1, Colossians 1, 1 Corinthians 1 uh, to look at biblical parameters in regards to the establishment of foundation for apologetics as a, as a whole. And so we were in Romans 1. And this is one of the issues that, that we've mentioned many times uh, on the program, but I mention it once again. Uh, the emphasis that Dr. Gagnon is making here is very, very important. Uh, people try to uh, take advantage of the fact that we haven't really thought through what Romans 1 is really discussing. And the reality is that the discussion in verses 26 and 27 of homosexuality, both lesbianism and, and, and male, is in the context of the result of the suppression of the truth, the fact that people are unapologetous. And you notice what he said. This is about, this is, these are universal condemnations here. Um, I don't think I mentioned on the last program that uh, Ochtemeyer, in his book, tries to get around this by saying that Romans 1 is just a trap. It's a rhetorical trap to catch the Jews of Romans 2. So it's not, it, it's really not applicable. And, I, and I'm just like, wow. Uh, because what's the conclusion that Paul gets to in Romans 3? We have concluded that all Jews and Gentiles are under sin. So the Romans 1 isn't some rhetorical trap that we can ignore. It's completely truthful. And in that completely truthful, drawn from the creation narrative parallels context, you have this clear condemnation. Not, and what he's talking about here is that a lot of the revisionists, and this woman is definitely a revisionist, a lot of the revisionists try to say, well, what's actually being referred to here is Paul's talking about people who are naturally heterosexuals trying out homosexuality. <laughs> These are the same people that say Paul didn't know about sexual orientation, except all of a sudden here he's functioning on the basis that it's just, it is, it is so, the only, the only term you can use for it is desperate. And when you're desperate handling the word of God, you're not actually handling the word of God. You're abusing the word of God, which is, exactly what um, this lady is doing. And by that, in the context, Paul means a nature argument, that God manifests who he is and what he has created on the basis of the material structures of creation. That's the clear evidence, so that even when people don't have the direct revelation of Scripture, from Genesis or Leviticus or otherwise, they're still anapagaletos, that is, they're without excuse, without legitimate defense, because that revelation of God oh, is Robert, given I'm, in can I Okay, yeah, let, let's, let's, let's pass the ball to, to Jane let's, for a little while. Okay. Let's yeah. go, but I think... Robert, I admire your certainty on everything. And frankly, I have to be honest, I don't care how many hundred pages people have written. I'm very much reminded of the wisdom of the wise I will frustrate. For me, it's about the nature of God and his love for us. I'm afraid your certainty that this is so wrong leaves no room whatsoever for giving life to people who... Um, <laughs> I'm thinking the teenager has just committed suicide. I mean, you you have a message of death, and you're so certain about it. I pray for you and your soul. Uh, I I just have to stop and go. You you've you've got to be kidding me. I I mean, but this is listen to the voice of a false prophetess. That's the only way to put this. It's I mean, like every time they have to drop that in there now. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Oh, side, oh yeah! You know? Oh that's! Oh yeah! You've got, and it's your it's, fault. It's obvious that that you might make people think too much here. You're 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 doing way too much Bible here, and way too many facts. So we need to stop that because we need to go back to emotions. Thinking might cause you to realize 
the truth of this subject, and that's not going to do. So let's get back to the emotions. You're you are so certain about things. What's the fa- what's the presupposition of that? That the Bible can't make anybody that certain? No, 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 no. The Bible is not sufficient to really answer this question, and therefore we have to go someplace else. We have to go to our emotions. We have to go to our feelings. And I, I just, I just listened to this, and and I. I I commend Dr. Gagnon for his patience Uh, because, I mean, that was just utterly uncalled for. You are speaking death. No, ma'am, you are. You are. Eternal death and death in this life. You are promoting the culture of death. There is no positive outcome of this lifestyle that you have chosen to engage in. You're not creating any life. You're not experiencing life. You're cutting other people off from life. This is a part of the culture of death. And yet, what is maddening is when people who are engaging in bogus forms of argumentation turn around and boldly accuse you of doing the very thing falsely that they are doing. Um, I, I'm not sure I would have been able to to have stayed as quiet as Dr. Gagnon did for as long as he did. Because I think, I hope that your leaders, your, your listeners, um, Justin, will listen um, deeply with their hearts as to what the they hall. feel is truly happening here. We can, when I was at Procter & Gamble in my uh, first year, I was given a set of um, 400 pages of research um, and asked to go and write a business plan for the launch of something called Fairy Sensitive. And I spent hours doing it, brought all the, the, the data I could find and took it to the board. And uh, we had a long discussion about it. And half an hour after, um, afterwards, I was called back into the board. And they said, Jane, we've decided not to launch. Can you use the same set of research and go and write another business plan <laughs> as to why it's absolutely the wrong thing to do? Mm. And with exactly the same data, mm. I went and made another case. Now, it's, do you hear what's being said? The Bible is a set of data. It's it's not God speaking so that we can know him, know his will, live in light of his will. No, it, it's just it's just a bunch of data that we can just massage and and turn into whatever we want. You need to hear these people to embrace what these people are saying is the death of the Christian faith. Look at every denomination that has followed, followed these people. They're either dead and gone or dying really fast. Look at the Anglican Church in England. Hello? But this is the voice. This is the very the very mindset of the enemies of the faith within the church. And yes, I consider this woman an enemy of the faith. I mean, she is telling us, don't you dare look to the Bible to know what God's will is. Look into your heart. Would you like to have a bite of the apple while you're at it? Same stuff. Third verse, but it's the same stuff. Same source, too. The ultimate thing is what is going on in our spirits beforehand to try and help us interpret this. Mm. And I would suggest that the ultimate place to start is looking at Christ, what Christ has done for us. How are you going to know what Christ has done for us? How do you know anything about Christ? You go to the Word. And the Christ of the Word says the exact opposite about God's law than you do. So what do we do now? Which is to ensure that in his death on the Christ, there is nothing else that is needed to bring everyone into the kingdom. I think you've distorted, actually, that giving a truncated version of the gospel. I think Amen. that's part of the problem, your whole picture. But I also want to address the fact, earlier you had somewhat of an ad hominem attack on me with regard to my certainty, which I think is inappropriate. Okay, first of all, it may be that a particular case in Scripture does have overwhelming evidence. So it's a kind of manipulative argument to then say your certainty is the problem. Maybe it's your lack of ability to respond to the arguments in question, and then you lash out with an ad hominem attack at somebody that's their certainty that's the problem. Maybe the problem is your inability to actually defend the position. (laughs) And then you have an overarching presentation of the gospel that seems to completely leave out 
about the fact that Christ doesn't just call us to get what we want. Mm-hmm. He calls so. us to take up our cross, to lose our lives, and deny, deny ourselves. That doesn't, mm-hmm. to me, sound like getting what I want, when I want it, with whom I want it well, with. Well, that's yeah, not quite what James said, in, in a sense. But, but, okay, look. I, I don't want it is to get too heated. That's how she expresses it. Wait, wait, let me finish it. Let me finish Now, I've been interrupted repeatedly after earlier sentences. So let me just finish my thought. You're the one who's interrupted me, No, no, you've done it repeatedly. I could have noted it, but I didn't. Okay, well, well, look, look, okay. Let me just finish this. Again. <laughs> Let so me just finish my tea, train of thought you're interrupting Can me. Can we have some tea it. now? Crumpets? My train of thought is you have a notion about what fullness of life is, and that fullness of life is not reflected in the gospel. Paul, on a regular basis, had a life much more troubling than yours, mine, or anyone else around here. Every day he would get up in the morning. He could be beaten by rods by secular authorities. He could be whipped 40 lashes minus one in the synagogues. He could be stoned, and we're not talking about drugs here. He was poorly sheltered, poorly clad, poorly fed in constant anxiety for his churches. By your token of definition of what a meaningful existence is, he should have been absolutely miserable and blame God every day of his life for the kind of experiences he had, even beaten up just en route to share the gospel without actually sharing it. What's the point of that? Shipwrecked, etc. His point is that he's rejoicing. Because as he carries around in the body the dying of Jesus, the life of Jesus is being manifested in him. As he is brought to the point of wondering whether he's, he's even going to live the next day, as he talks about in Second Corinthians 1, he is brought to the point of relying on the God who raised him let's, from the dead. That's what cruciform okay. existence we'll, we'll, is like. Let's what allow Jane a response. One other point. On a personal we'll, note, <laughs> you are not the only one that's ever suffered. Okay. Okay, all of us have suffered. I could, deal, I could talk to you about personal experiences that I've had. But the suffering that I go through, the experience I go through never entitles me to violate the commandments of God. Let's let's allow a couple of minutes for James. Can I just ask, is, this, starting to... um, is there a camera on this room? Justin? No, there is not. Because no, it would no. be interesting, wouldn't it? How many fingers are being wagged at me um, <laughs> uh, all at once? Anyway, That's I think the, the ultimate okay. um, thing is what people feel that God has called them to. I've... Right back to feelings. You you've just been shredded to the foundation. With biblical language and words, it's what people feel. It's all they've got. It's all they've got. There's, it's all there is. It's all there is. What people feel. What people feel. Uh, that's what the whole encounter was. The whole encounter. Oh, she tried earlier on to you know do some of the revisionist stuff, but Gagnon you know knocked those out of the park, and she figured out pretty quickly that there was no way she was going to defend that stuff. Uh, what what people. There you go. Oh my. Uh eight seven 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 five three 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 four one. Did we have a phone call earlier that uh we just didn't didn't hold on to? Oh you just decided it wasn't uh Well there really isn't a topic, but eight seven 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 five three 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 four one is the phone number. Uh you can call in on that. I, I would like to try to um uh What's, uh, how do I say, I'd like to keep this a gluten-free uh, dividing line, so uh, we won't, let, let's let's just make it a flourless dividing line, please, if we could. Thank you. We're That'd be great. taking your calls on Sermon Audio. <laughs> Even Sermon Audio popped into Twitter, I don't know if you saw that. It says, uh, uh, Ser- Sermon Audio, uh, uh, someone, I guess, tagged them or something. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Thank yeah. you guys for uploading the dividing line on Sermon Audio. Thank you indeed. Cool. So, so yeah. Except I understand that uh, uh, Pulpit and Pen is a little upset with us now. Well, uh, again, when you when you move the cheese around in the refrigerator, um, let's just say sometimes you have to move other people to a lower shelf. <laughs> <clears throat> Oh, look, it's the phone. I have to get that now. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, I saw something. I, I don't know where I saw it. I think it was on Twitter, but uh, I saw, either that or Facebook, one of the two, where the pulpit and pen guys were saying, you know, for a long time, pulpit and pen has been the number one or number two podcast on Sermon Audio. Then Alpha and Omega decided to put the dividing line on Sermon Audio, so I'm not sure what that means. I have no <laughs> earthly idea uh, at all what that means. Oh! Oh, 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 drat. 
Um, get those, uh, get those, um, uh, DL material. How about all notes? There we go. Real quick. I'll try to be quick on this. Sorry. I'll try to be quick on this. Um, and I'll try to follow my own, what I was just about to say here. I forgot that this afternoon I was linked to a article about Connect 316 Supper at the SBC. The SBC Submaps Convention is coming up. And Connect 316, the theme of their supper is going to be leaving Geneva. We will hear the testimonies of three former Calvinists as they describe the process of their spiritual journey away from Calvinistic theology. Afterwards, we'll entertain a brief question and answer period. Each registered participant will receive a box supper and four books. One of them, the books, is called uh, God So Loved the World, Traditional Baptists and Calvinists by Fisher Humphreys and Paul Robertson. Now, I don't know these names. Sorry. Don't know that stuff. But shortly after I posted something about that, um, other folks on Twitter, and I'd, I'd mention your name. I just want to get you in too much trouble. <laughs> uh, started going, well, that's weird that they'd be promoting a book like by that guy because it's well known that that guy denies penal substitutionary atonement. And I'm like, where, where did you get that? And they linked me to an article by Al Mohler from last year, or was it, uh, no, two years ago, August of 2013. Very interesting article called The Wrath of God Was Satisfied, Substitutionary Atonement, The Conservative Resurgence in the Southern Baptist Convention. And so if you search for that on Moeller's page, it will it will come up. I I was unaware of just how rabidly liberal, rabidly liberal, many of the Southern Baptist seminaries were uh, prior to the quote-unquote resurgence. I mean, the SBC was doomed uh, if, if that continued. There's no two ways about it. <clears throat> he talks, talks about uh, Theodore Clark. Um... And uh, Clark openly rejected theology of the cross that proposed that the crucified Jesus was regarded as man's substitute or as man's sin bearer, taking man's place that God's wrath would fall on him rather than sinful man. Uh, he denied inerrancy, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, then you had um, Frank Stagg, uh, who taught at New Orleans and then moved to Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville. Uh, and in fact, uh, Moeller talks about having him as a professor. How Professor Stagg repeatedly and emph emphatically rejected what he called bloody cross religion. He vociferously denied the necessity of the cross, insisting that God did not have to avenge a killing at Calvary in order to arrange a killing at Calvary in order to forgive sin. Um, and it, it, let me read this. In his influential New Testament theology published when Stagg was still on the New Orleans faculty, Stagg stated his case clearly. Quote, listen to this. God is free to forgive. The Father does not need to punish the Son in order to win the right to forgive. Were the Father paid off, then there would be no forgiveness. God himself forgives, and in so doing, he assumes responsibility for the sinner. End quote. Folks, that is word for word the Muslim view. That's word for word the Muslim objection to the cross. Word for word. And these people were teaching. These people were teaching in Southern Baptist schools. Wow. Um, Stag likewise denied the inerrancy of the Bible. Doesn't, I, it's the only, only way to get around to it. But then, here you go. The last of the trio of theologians at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary is Fisher Humphreys. One of the authors of one of the books being given away by the anti-Calvinist group at SBC. Hmm. Uh, unlike Stagg and Clark, Humphreys clearly affirmed the centrality of the cross, and he rightly warned that no human theory or model of the atonement can contain all the truth about the cross revealed in the New Testament. But Humphreys also sought to shift the church away from penal substitutionary understandings of the atonement. His 1978 book, The Death of Christ, 
Humphreys conceded that there could be a healthy understanding of substitution, but he emphatically denied that the father punished the son for our sins on the cross. In his words, men punished him for alleged crimes, probably blasphemy and revolution, but God, who knew he was righteous, did not disapprove of him at all. He approved of him. To put it another way, Jesus experienced the pain which a man might feel if he were being punished by God for great sins, but he was not punished by God. And then I was pointing to another article from 2002 regarding Bruce Ware, Southern, Southern prophet in the middle of growing open theism debate, where Humphreys, in talking about open theism, uh, specifically said... Uh, it was down here. I should have. Yeah, I should have had this uh, marked. I. That's why I just forgot all about it. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Humphreys. Humphreys. Where to go? Uh, he was talking about open theism, and he was talking about how basically it's it's not that it's not that bad a thing, and that we should be able to discuss it in our churches and so on and so forth. And it's the same guy. Uh, yeah, here we go. There it is. Also in June, theologian Fisher Humphreys helped lead a breakout session on open theism at the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship General Assembly. He said that while he's not fully persuaded that open theism is biblical, quote, quote, it should be given serious consideration in our churches and schools. Sounds like the anti-Calvinist Southern Baptists um, don't have a problem with open theism too much. Huh. I thought the Baptist faith and message completely precluded it. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So they're giving a book away uh, at the anti-Calvinist, for, the former anti, the former Calvinist dinner, uh, including stuff like that. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that exciting? It's very exciting. Okay, the phone's filled up quickly, so let's, uh, speaking of New Orleans... Let's go to Jarrett. Hi, Jarrett. Hey, Mr. White. Why are you ragging on my local schools like that? I don't appreciate it. Well, you know, um, they've, they've had some issues. <laughs> I'm just kidding, obviously. <laughs> but uh, I called last time and with a question, and I kind of had a follow-up on that because I think we kind of got away from what I was asking about and started talking about total inability. But... Um, what I was wondering was that, you know, I I don't believe in synergism. Uh, I would consider myself a monergist, but I think you would consider me a synergist, just to show you where I'm coming from. But I am having trouble understanding how if God ordains through the preaching of his word that this is how salvation is to be given to the world, in our day, how that wouldn't be also considered synergism because man has to do something, it, not not the, the man that's getting saved, but another man has to do something in order for someone to be saved, according to the system I believe that, that you're teaching. Where am I going wrong on that? Well, um... Exact same answer I gave you last time, and, and if, I, if I didn't explain it clear enough last time, I apologize, but I, there's not much else I can say. Uh, you're confusing the means with the issue of man having to cooperate in providing uh, his autonomous choice and his activity so as to have multiple streams of powers working to bring about salvation. You're confusing that where the ultimate outcome is dependent upon the cooperation of these things with God's decree, which uses means, but those means do not become uh, autonomous. Uh, they're not made out of, of autonomous wills. It's the word of God. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. He uses people uh, to proclaim the gospel, uh, but that's a part of his divine decree. Um, the fact of the matter is the salvation of God's elect is monergistic because one power brings it about, and that is the Holy Spirit of God brings spiritual life to the individual. If you are saying that, well, God wants to do that, but he has to uh, depend upon the action of the autonomous will of the creature before he can do that, then you're bringing multiple forces together that have to work together in a synergistic fashion to bring about salvation. And you're confusing means 
which are a certain result of God's decree, uh, with the concept of synergism, where there really isn't a divine decree as to what the result is going to be. Uh, you may have divine foreknowledge, but the decree didn't uh, determine what was going to take place. So, you're confusing categories. Um, that's not that's not the context in which monergism and synergism, those terms have been used uh, in the past to discuss the relationship of the human will and the divine will in salvation. Uh, you're, con you're inserting stuff that no one ever thought to insert into that conversation because they recognize that something like the Word of God is not in the same category as the human will in regards to the doctrine of salvation. So, um, well, that's... I'm not talking about the Word of God specifically. I'm talking about a man preaching the Word of God to another person, and, and you say that, that this is something that God has ordained to to bring light and salvation to the world right. through 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 a man, and that is a quote unquote synergistic cooperation of man, and it, that it can't happen without that man preaching the word to somebody. Well, the preaching of the word is the result of God's sovereign decree, who has determined all things that, that happen in time. Uh, that is not a part of the historical discussion. The historical discussion is, is God's will sufficient to bring about salvation of individual, or is God's will that every person be saved, and the determining factor is whether every individual will choose to be saved, uh, so that God's will's uh, fruition and success is dependent upon man. Um, I, I don't don't have any other any other way I can make it any clearer to you, Jarrett. Sorry, but um, okay. Well, I, let me ask you one other thing though, because I'm looking in in Romans 10, and it says that with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And that you know whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And to me, that sounds like you call upon the Lord. And then you're saved, not, you know, you're saved, which enables you to call upon the name of the Lord. Can yeah. you explain to me? Yeah. Uh, have you have you read The Potter's Freedom? I have not. Yeah. Uh, you're asking a lot of, of the basic questions uh, that, that, that the book addresses because you're confusing regeneration and salvation as if they're the same thing. Obviously, salvation is a much larger category. Um, and uh, we, we really did address uh, those those basic issues. Uh, rather fully there. Uh, there's, there's a reason, Jarrett, why people in history have developed the language they've developed and address it the way they address it, because it gets to the fundamental foundational issues without having to keep reinventing the wheel for every generation. And that's one of the things that, that concerns me about a lot of modern folks. That's one of the reasons I wrote The Potter's Freedom, is uh, uh, Norman Geisler was basically thumbing his nose at all preceding generations in completely redefining all the language and, and ignoring uh, the fact that this has been discussed for a long, long time. And some very, very smart people on both sides have discussed this for a very, very long, long time. And uh, we're it, it's silly of us to keep reinventing the wheel. What we should do is get up to speed with what has already been discussed and then see if there's anything we can add to that. But that's generally not how it ends up getting done, unfortunately. I, just, I don't have a lot of, you know, I don't, I'm kind of a <laughs> broke dude, you know, I, buying, buying books is, is not easy for me. You know, I was just hoping that we could talk, you know, maybe you could give me a, a short answer for, for that or something. So I didn't, I don't, I don't mean to, uh, well, Jared, to, I, I, I'm, I, this is going to sound really rough, but there are things called libraries and they're really cool. And we don't use them enough anymore. But I'm pretty sure you could get a library card for absolutely nothing. And uh, if they don't have the book in the library, they'll actually get it for you. Um, so uh, you know, uh, when I was when I was in school, there were books I needed that were way beyond my ability to get. But that's what a library is for. Um, so, uh -huh. brother, you gotta you gotta do some digging in if you if you wanna if you wanna move forward. That's... Well, I just wanted to get your take on it, you know. Well, so that, that, well that, that's all. I mean, but I'll, I'll go, you know, to the library and go. Well, I, as I said, I, I gave my take on answer. it, and that is you're you're confusing uh, salvation and regeneration. 
Those are not the same things. Is adoption the same thing as regeneration? Um, no, it's not, but they're both part of salvation, right? So salvation is an overarching term. Regeneration is a, has reference to one aspect. Adoption, another aspect. Forgiveness, sanctification. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of aspects uh, to the overarching concept of salvation. And so you have to keep that in mind uh, because that's a New Testament category that's given to us. Okay. Okay. So, all right. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Jared. All right. Let's talk to uh, Jason. Hi, Jason. Hi, Dr. White. Thanks for taking my call. Hope you're doing well. Yes, sir. Um, I had a question on Leviticus 18 and 20, and it's, I guess, it's a little bit related to what you were reviewing on the unbelievable debate uh, earlier. Um, so I was I had a question by a church uh, member asking me, um, you know, where did Cain get his wife? And uh, and I told him, you know, is most likely from one of uh, Adam and Eve's uh, um, daughters. Um, and then, you know, he gets into the issue, well, don't we have this prohibition against incest? Um, I don't know if you've get into this get into this topic in your book, uh, the same sex controversy, because I admit I I don't own that one of yours yet. Um, but uh, my question is, uh, if God's immutability and His unchangingness, um, it seems to me to be some type of violation of the order of uh, sexual union. You know, when He permits. Uh, the first and sec the second generation of human beings to, you know, to engage in this type of activity, um, when Leviticus eighteen and twenty seem to indicate that that type of union is prohibited for all nations uh, universally. Um, can you help me understand that? Well, it's a it's an old uh, it's an old question uh, that the Bible does not address. Um, we are going on pre on assumptions as to um, ancient contexts, but the obvious answer is, uh, I, I think, really, really simple and really, really straightforward. Um, it's God's purpose that the human race exist. Um, so if uh, if there was no other way to uh, to continue as a species and to be fruitful and multiply. Um, then I don't see how anyone can make the argument, well, but he said to Moses, yeah, uh, there's plenty of folks on the earth at that point in time. Um, when you only have a couple dozen, how, how can you make the argument that what is given to Moses uh, for the normative situation where you have a huge human population is the same in, in, the, first, in the first two generations or three generations? I, how does that follow? I don't get that. I mean, that doesn't mean God's not immutable, but it's just it's just completely ignoring the context of the situation. I mean, I mean, it, the only other option is I made you, but I, oh, gosh, I forgot this is against my law. Oh, well, you're all just going to go out of existence because you can't uh, break this law, which I haven't given to you yet, but we'll give later on. But don't do it now. And therefore, that's the end. Um, I, I, I struggle a little bit to see how that follows. I, I guess it comes down to me is the what God you know the the law the uh, the Mosaic Covenant wasn't given to those other nations if I if I understand correctly but uh, and yet, but, but 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 Jason yeah completely different context we're talking about nations there are no nations in the first few generations are there yeah right I don't see how that can be ignored can it. Well, how can how, can you help me understand that then? I don't understand how that's a category error because it would just seemed to me that it's something applicable to everyone, especially now when we. Uh, I'm not trying to be devil's advocate on this. Either. No, Jason. Jason, I don't. I don't know how else to explain it. Absolutely unique situation at the beginning of humanity, never repeated again. How can that not be unique? Right. Okay. I mean, how can that not be unique? A has there ever been a time? I mean, I suppose after Noah. Uh, yeah. You're back down to, you know, almost nobody there. Uh, but the, the, the point is that that kind of, of situation assumes the ability not to engage in the activity. Because there are 
enough people to continue the human race by other means. But that wasn't the case in the first few generations. So I don't see how that could not explain itself or, or not be not be part, you know, be the very answer itself. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I guess I'm just caught up on that. You know, like you said, it's assuming, not thinking about it as a unique situation. Um, it couldn't so. be much more unique than that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, All right. it, okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, bye bye. All right, one more. Uh, we'll go a little bit late here, but that's you know that's that's the joy of not being on a network. <laughs> Don't have to worry about it. Hi, Nick. Hey, how are you doing, Doctor White? Doing all right. I uh, just had a really quick question about covenant theology. Uh, that doesn't um, sound very. I quick. come from a. Uh, I've, I come from a dispensational uh, King James only Calvary Chapel background. Um, so I've been picking up a few books from uh, Dr. Richard Barcelos and uh, the Renahan, and just wanted Those to know your scary thoughts people. on very scary people. The federalism. I'm sorry. Uh, just wanted to know your thoughts on um, the 1689 federalists. I guess you could say the movement going on. Um, you know the 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 difference. I uh, guess between how they would see the 20th century Baptists and the 1689. Baptists who reject the um, one covenant under multiple administrations. Yeah, Nick, that's not a, that's not a brief question. And what I would do is uh, I would uh, direct you to uh, Dr. Rosellis and to Dr. Renahan for their books on that subject. And uh, it would be something that would require pretty much an entire conversation to get into. And uh, right at the end of the program, that's not going to work a lot. So I appreciate appreciate the phone call today. Um, next. Saturday, as I said, the debate with the Imam. And then next week, I want to try to find the time at some point we've got to start getting the James Brown stuff. We just we just got to. I don't know how to do it. But we'll try. We will try. Uh Pulpit and Pen says, okay, it's on. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. They're they're a scary, they're scary, they're a well armed group. Uh, uh, Little, little hey, when they get cool music like we have, yeah, they don't have cool music know? like we have. Uh, they're, 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 yeah, that's that's true. All right, anyways, gotta run. Lots to do. See you next time. God bless.